Uh, well, my name is Melissa. Uh, I am from Colorado. I moved to Kansas City a couple of years ago, um, but my, uh, my love for beer started um, in Seattle uh, as, a, as a teenager like any well-rounded uh, American kid, uh, but then uh, moved to Colorado and started working in the restaurant industry. Um, I started at kind of a fine dining place called Earl's. I don't know if anybody's ever been to one. It's a Canadian chain, um, but at that time, micro beers were not too terribly uh, widespread. Uh, we were doing a lot of imports, and the first beer that I fell in love with was McCaffrey's. I don't know if anybody's ever had that. They stopped importing it, um, but it was essentially kind of a, a nitrogen-infused beer. It tasted like mother's milk. Um, and from that point on, I kind of just wanted to discover every type of beer that there was out there. Um, Earl's was a little too uh, high class for me, so I moved on to a sports bar where we had a lot more Colorado craft beer. Um, and then from that point, I bugged my beer distributor enough to where I could get a job on the distribution side of things. So in Colorado, uh, I sold beer for about three years for a big Miller house. Uh, Breckenridge beer was one of the beers uh, in our facility. We also sold uh, a lot of imports, a lot of Mexican beers. We actually sold O'Fallon's as well. Um, and then when my husband got transferred to Kansas City, Breckenridge said, we want you to work for us directly out in Kansas and Missouri. And I said, wonderful, I would love to. Um, so that's how I came to be standing in front of you here today. That's the short version. Um, a little bit of a background on Breckenridge Brewery. We are celebrating our 26th year uh, this past summer. Um, obviously, a lot of you know of Vanilla Porter, that being one of our biggest ones. Breckenridge Brewery started up in Breckenridge uh, in the ski area. Um, it's essentially a brew pub. It's a restaurant brew pub. If you go there, if you've been there, you can kind of see them. They brew right behind the bar. Um, they kind of walk on two by fours uh, to put the malts and the hops in. It's probably not OSHA certified by any means, but... Um, it's not a place that you would go get a tour. You sit down at the bar, order a beer, and you get to watch them make it right there. Um, a couple of years after it started, we started um, selling our beers uh, around the mountain towns and eventually down in Denver. Well, obviously, we were uh, had uh, some space constraints, uh, so we opened a facility uh, right downtown. Um, and uh, started distributing uh, all over Colorado, and um, I think Kansas was one of the first states that we moved into outside of Colorado. Uh, a couple years after we moved to that location, Coors Field was built, and we could not get trucks in and out uh, on game day to uh, load them up, so we kept that location and moved to another location to brew beer to distribute from. Uh, so at this point, we had two restaurants and a brewery restaurant. Um, I think Breckenridge really had a love for bringing people in, feeding them food and drink. Uh, a lot of their recipes with food was all cooking uh, with a beer, pairing it with the food. Um, so after we moved to our third location uh, in Denver, Calamuth Street, um, we opened three more restaurants around the Colorado area, one in Grand Junction, one downtown, um, one up in the mountains. Um, so Breckenridge, instead of like the new Belgiums of the world that kind of set out and started growing their footprint around the U.S., um, we kind of stayed in Colorado and we kind of did the restaurant brew pub thing for quite a while. Um, hence, if you try a lot of Breckenridge's beers, um, they're very well balanced. They're very approachable. Um, they're definitely meant to cook with and to pair with food. Um, so we were at the downtown location um, for 18, 19 years or so. Um, and we got stuck brewing at maximum capacity once again. That was about 65,000 barrels was our max capacity down at that downtown location. Um, so we were looking to try to stay there, but just spread our elbows out a little bit more. Um, unfortunately, uh, medical marijuana had passed at that time, 
and uh, prices kind of skyrocketed. So we had to start looking to the suburbs. Um, so really quick, I'll, ta I'll tell you about Vanilla Porter. I'll pause there for a minute. Um, I don't need to tell you about this beer per se. I think everybody's probably had it. But we have the Breckenridge Brew Pub up in Breckenridge. Well, we do a lot of test beers up there. That's kind of our test facility. Jimmy, our brewer up there, comes up with crazy stuff. So he was making this for the locals and the tourists. Well, they started coming down to our Denver facility and saying, can I get a vanilla porter? Um, our owner, uh, Todd Usry, head brewmaster, said, no, I don't put vanilla in my beer. If you want that beer, you got to go back up to the mountains. And so he would not make this beer at the Denver location for five or six years. He was heavily, heavily pressured year after year. Um, and finally, he caved. Uh, and he'll tell people all the time, I've never liked this beer, kind of a sore spot for him. Um, but obviously, it's turned into our flagship beer. He was wrong. Jimmy was right. The locals were right. The tourists were right. Um, it's just a classic porter, a uh, little bit of chocolate coffee, uh, roasted malts, um, and then the best part is that nice uh, vanilla bean on the finish, not extract, so it's not overly sugary or sweet, um, uh, but the vanilla beans from uh, Papua New Guinea and Madagascar, it's kind of fun to say, um, just add a little something, a little something extra that you don't get from, you know, your classic porter flavor. Uh, five and a half percent, a little bit, a little bit less than that maybe on the ABV, but a delicious beer nonetheless. Um, and, and this is one of the ones that we tend to do um, a lot of different things with barrel aging, um, nitrogen infused, um, so I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so once, let me take a sip, hang on. Uh, that's good. So uh, once we were able to find a spot uh, to move our Denver location, um, through looking over and over for five or six years or so, they decided that they just needed to build something from the ground up. Um, they weren't going to be able to find a building that was there that they can convert or anything like that. So we uh, happened upon an old uh, carnation farm in Littleton, Colorado. So that gave us about 12 acres um, that we could just build a huge brewery, uh, 76,000 square feet actually. Uh, a brewery, uh, a cellar, and warehouse space. And then we also went ahead and built an 8,000 square foot restaurant on site as well. Um, so if you get an opportunity to go to Littleton, um, you can eat, drink, listen to bands. Usually have bands all weekend long. And then you can walk right across the parking lot and take tours as well of the new facility. Um, it brought us up to 110,000 barrel capacity, uh, and then we have enough room to grow to 300 barrels. Um, so it's very exciting. So you might see a lot of new offerings from Breckenridge now in the market, now that we've been in there for a couple of years, been able to test the equipment. Uh, it's a 100 barrel brew house. It's a Steinecker brew house uh, from Germany. Uh, it wasn't picked out of a catalog. It was uh, built from our head brewer's mind. Uh, there was over a million welds done on site. Um, it's the only one like it. Um, probably won't be able to say that too much because um, we have a lot of other breweries coming and looking at it. But um, it kind of, uh, the brew house sits in kind of a nice vaulted room. It almost looks like a church. There was absolutely no, no expense spared. Um, it's quite amazing. Um, we have 16 400 barrel fermenters, uh, American made Mueller actually from Springfield, Missouri. Um, when all of those are filled, to give you an idea of the capacity of the brewery, when all those are filled, that's a little over 2 million beers in those. Um, so it's quite a step up from where we were at the Denver location, which is very exciting. Uh, we also have a, a Crohn's bottling line, a Crohn's canning line, and most recently, we just opened up a nitrogen canning line as well. Um, so not only are we uh, be able to increase our production um, and our uh, amount of beer that we're able to put out, but this new uh, facility also helps us create um, our efficiency. Uh, we're using about 20% less malt than we were at the Denver location, and we're still getting the same yields from that. Um, 
We use a vapor condenser uh, that actually turns steam into hot water, and we use that as the hot liquor. Uh, so it saves us money, uh, 1,500 gallons per brew of water, and then it also uh, saves on the energy uh, to bring that water up to the correct temperature as well. Um, we take all of the spent grain and yeast uh, up to a farmer in Fort Lupton, just like a lot of craft breweries will do. Um, all of the used water goes uh, back into irrigation on our land. Um, let's see, what else? There's so many. S it is a lot, isn't it? Um, they're currently working on a uh, cooling system. So uh, all of our finished product is stored in the warehouse. This cooling system, when the temperature outside reaches 47 degrees, it'll automatically shut off and fans uh, and vents will kick on and use the outside uh, cool air uh, to keep the product cool um, instead of using energy. So it's really quite fabulous. Oh. Did everybody finish all of their vanilla porter already? These are, these are large samples, you guys. <laughs> oh, I'm like, I feel bad wasting it. Well, cheers. Well, let's move on to Christmas. I apologize that it's... Okay, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I got you. I got you. I'm on it. Okay. Uh, Christmas in November, it's not my fault, it's Hobby Lobby's fault. They're the one who puts up Halloween stuff and summertime and Christmas stuff in October. So we just had to keep up with them. Um, Christmas, obviously, is one of our favorite time of year. Uh, we make big, huge, heavy, malty beers. This is the time of year that we really can dive into them. Uh, this is a classic strong ale. Um, we use uh, chocolate and uh, caramel malts in this one. And then... Um, we use uh, Chinook and Mount Hood hops to add the spice. We don't add uh, an adjunct spice to it, just the, the hops create that spice to it. Uh, it's nice and warming in your belly, 7% alcohol, which is always a, a plus, you know, the higher and higher that goes. And it helps you deal with Christmas and your in-laws and whatnot. Um, yeah, and this is the, uh, the shortest time period available this seasonal uh, out of all of our four seasonals. Uh, and it outsells the other three uh, combined in that, in that time period. Um, so talking about the new brewery and the new fun things that we're able to do in it, um, we have a big, huge cellar that ha has room for about 600 barrels. Uh, so we've really started um, doing a lot of barrel aging. Um, our, uh, our bottling line can do 12 ounce, 22 ounce, and then 750 milliliter bottles um, as well. So. Uh, we'll take our regular mainline beers and we'll mess around with those. So, for instance, the Christmas ale um, in uh, about a month uh, will come out in a bourbon barrel aged uh, variety called Hollidale. And that one comes in a 22 ounce and then limited draft as well. Mm hmm. Uh, I believe it's 19, it, it, yeah. Yeah, so the Chinook hops, the way that they're applied is to get the, um, the spice out of them as opposed to the bitterness out of them. It is good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's all take another sip, probably. Um, the 750 milliliters is something that we did a little bit at the Denver location, but again, uh, we didn't have this high-tech... Uh, bottling line, so it took quite a bit um, to shut it down and uh, get it reset to do different size bottles and whatnot. So it's something we're really excited about. Um, these actually, these 750 milliliter bottles up here are uh, prizes, raffle prizes for you guys later on tonight. Um, and this line of beers is called Brewery Lane. Um, that's actually uh, the, the street that we got to name because we had to make a new street for the brewery. Um, this is the Brewery Lane series. So um, these are, you know, really, really handcrafted recipes that we haven't done before. Um, they'll probably change every single year. They're trying to release about four a year. Um, this one's an Imperial White IPA, a uh, little bit of lemongrass in it. It's quite delicious. Um, it's got some Colorado artists, local um, artwork on the front as well, picture, picturesque uh, 
a landscape of the brewery on there. Um, they wanted to make the brewery kind of look like a, like a, like a barn. They wanted it to fit in in the rural uh, Littleton, Colorado. Has anybody here ever been to Littleton, Colorado? Yeah. Um, it's, it's the middle of the suburbs. Um, it sits on a Santa Fe is the main road that our brewery's on. Um, and just a little bit further is 470. That's the highway that will take you essentially out to I-70 up to the mountains. Um, we also back to the Platte River. Um, so the city of Littleton has just been very, very excited about us coming to town and, and bringing all this business to them, um, that they've reinvested so much money into the city. So the Platte River, they're actually right where it is behind our brewery. Um, they're digging it out and turning it into a kayaking course. So you will be able to kayak down, drop in if you want to, come have some beers, uh, go back out. I'm sure that's totally safe. But... I don't kayak for that reason. <laughs> I have beers, that's it. Um, there's also a bike path that'll take you all the way down to Denver, and then we're about um, maybe half a mile walk to the light rail system as well. Um, so it's really quite fun. If you're able to make it out there, you can, you, know, you can stay down in Denver and jump on a light rail and come down to the brewery and then head back without having to rent a car or anything like that. Um, let me take another sip. Let me get some more brain juice, and it'll remind me what I want to talk about. Hey. Hey, maybe. Uh, fresh hop? Oh, cheers. Yeah? Okay. Um, I believe it is. Uh, real quick, Fresh Hop Pale Ale, 6% alcohol. Uh, the Fresh Hop on this one is Citra. Uh, we did it two different ways. Uh, we did it as a Fresh Hop in the boil, and then we did it as a dry hop uh, in the fermentation tanks. Um, we had to use two different styles of hops. We used the Fresh Hop, uh, the traditional hops in uh, the boil, and then we had to use the pellets in the fermentation tanks so that it wouldn't clog it up. Um, 30 IBUs, so a pale ale, not overly bitter, uh, but you definitely get some of those nice citrus notes as well. Well, you asked the question. <laughs> Barrel aged, we put the pull date. And then the bourbon, uh, or anything that's been in a, been in a barrel, uh, is the vintage date. So it's the born on date because, you know, you can drink it when it's ready to go, or you can save it for three years and, you know, have all your friends over and start sniffing beer and <laughs> get really geeky. <laughs> so, three days before Christmas, we got announced that we were selling to Anheuser-Busch. Uh, it could have been the end of the world, but it wasn't. Um, Basically, what that's meant for Breckenridge, which is fabulous, uh, is, in my opinion, a lot more money for us. Um, we wanted to do a lot of things that we weren't able to do. Um, I referred to Todd Usry before, um, our president, our previous owner. Um, he's a very wonderful man, and he wanted to... But he needed to buy out his partners. Uh, the people that were running the restaurants that I talked about had a different vision. They wanted to keep going to the restaurant side. Uh, and Todd wanted to keep going to the beer side. So Todd needed to figure out a plan. How do I keep all of my employees here? How do I keep control? What's the best option for me? Um, you know, a, a private equity was not a good idea for him. Uh, there was a lot of people interested, especially since they just built that gigantic $36 million state-of-the-art facility. Um, but at the end of the day, he thought that uh, Anheuser-Busch was going to give him the best, uh, the best chance to keep all of his employees. Uh, he signed on for five years uh, as the president of the company, so that tells me that he's not looking for a check and a beach to get to, but he's very interested in seeing uh, what he started uh, grow to a national brand. Um, I was talking a little bit about our... Um, our safety standards, um, that's something that Anheuser-Busch uh, is probably one of the best in the market at. Um, and they have taken Breckenridge and taken us to another level. So again, we have uh, so many breweries that uh, within Colorado and outside of Colorado that are coming to our facility. Um, a, a lot of them that kind of had some hate for us 
once we sold, um, are now signing up for our safety classes and our training classes, which is really wonderful. Um, we initially bought uh, 12 acres of that carnation farm. Um, there was a couple more acres for sale that uh, we couldn't afford at the time. Um, but now that we do have a little bit of a bigger checkbook, we just purchased those. And um, there, there's a little bit of gossip about what they're going to do. Craft brewers gossip more than like high school girls, I swear. Um, two things I have heard that are possibilities is we might do a cidery with those extra acres, just build it separately. Uh, and uh, a, a lot of us salespeople have constantly been asking uh, for sours. Uh, so uh, our head brewer is very, very worried about contamination. So that is a definite option as well that they might take that a uh, couple extra acres and, um, and do that. Moving on to my new love, Mango Mosaic Pale Ale. This is a year-round beer. This is, you're going to notice, uh, a much lighter body than the rest of our year-round beers. Our year-round beers are vanilla porter, avalanche, oatmeal stout, agave wheat. They're all pretty, pretty heavy. Uh, this is a really, really light body. Uh, we use mango concentrate puree in this beer. Uh, it's from Mexico. And then we use Cascade and Mosaic hops. Uh, the mosaic hops are applied uh, in the boil, and then uh, they do a recirculation with them for 24 hours. So that's why you're getting such an amazing nose on it. Uh, you'll get mango on the front, middle of the body, and then uh, those mosaic hops will round out the finish. A little bit of grapefruit, mango, papaya. Um, I, I feel like my taste buds are always grapefruit, everything. People are like, I get mango, I get papaya. I'm like, I never got papaya in that. Uh, five and a half percent on the alcohol and uh, 29 IBU. So right there for a, for a perfect pale ale. Uh, it does sometimes sound like a summertime beer, mango mosaic, but again, it is available year round. Um, was I in the middle of a story or should I start a new story? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I hate fruit. I want my beer to taste like a beer. Well, it does. It's a beer. It's a pale ale. It's a pale ale with a little bit of fruit flavor and some, you know, mosaic hops. They blend very well together. Um, we're not trying any of them tonight, but I do want to talk a little bit about the um, Nitro Can line um, that we just started releasing beers with. Um, they come in 16-ounce, four-packs. Our flagship uh, vanilla porter is available year-round in it. Nitro Vanilla Porter, the can just says NVP. Um, the R&D uh, took a little over a couple of million dollars. It's our brand new own technology that we um, hired somebody much smarter than us to build. Uh, but essentially, the can uh, has a widget connected to the bottom of the can. And we put a drop of liquid nitrogen into that widget. So a 16 ounce can is filled about 15.2 ounces. Uh, and then of course, once you crack open the can, uh, the nitrogen is released, creates that cascade effect. It's not filled all the way because Colorado is a have beer will travel state and you can't be carrying around a glass in your back pocket when you're trying to do a 14er or trying to mountain bike. So we wanted to make sure that we could create a vessel that you could take and drink anywhere. Um, so since we spent so much money on doing this, we needed to also create seasonals. So we weren't just doing one or two year-round nitros. Um, the previous seasonal uh, that we did, the first one we released, which we were going to have tonight, but I think we might have ran out of it. That might have been... That, that might have been the problem, Alex, wasn't it? Sold it all. Uh, was, don't hate me for saying it, it was a pumpkin spice latte stout. <laughs> they may or may not have been at Starbucks when they came up with that one. I'm not sure. Um, but essentially, uh, it was a coffee stout. It was a very, very delicious beer. Uh, very light pumpkin flavor. They actually used uh, pumpkin uh, flakes. Uh, which if you see it, it looks like oatmeal. Um, and, and that's how it's applied to the beer uh, and the boil. 
Um, so if you drink the beer at room temperature, you definitely would get the pumpkin flavor. Um, if you smell it, you know, when it's served at its temp typical temperature, uh, you mainly are going to get a coffee stout. Um, it was a f fabulous beer. I really enjoyed it. Uh, the next one that comes out, it hasn't quite hit your market, um, but I may or may not have been able to bring some for you guys tonight, uh, is a uh, nitro chocolate orange stout. It sounds like those little candies that your grandma carried around in her pocket that you were always over there trying to get. It is. It is very good. What's that? It's not out yet. Maybe, I forget what your shipment said, two weeks maybe? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But it is. It's very, very delicious. Um, that one, uh, chocolate and orange are very, very funny flavors. When you say that, they could go so many different directions. So uh, on that beer, they used um, cacao. <laughs> I don't know why it's not pronounced cocoa or cacao. Uh, it's from Boulder, Colorado, um, and it's essentially a cold-pressed cacao bean uh, into a uh, syrup form. Um, I was talking to one of the brewers today, and he said, it is so good with coffee. And I said, what are you talking about? Are you guys over there mixing your coffee with the cacao? He said, yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> We joke about our brewers. Our new facility is all automated. They have a gigantic control panel. So our brewers, it used to be, you know, getting a full day's workout, uh, now sit around with their feet up drinking coffee <laughs> and pushing buttons. So I guess they get bored a little bit and they need to go uh, indulge and throw some cacao into their coffee. Um, we also use a little bit of natural... Uh, orange flavoring and mandarin hops in that beer as well. So um, it's not a milk chocolate chocolate. It's more of a semi-sweet baker's chocolate flavor that you're going to get from it and more of a, more of a orange, uh, kind of like orange from the Rhine flavor that you're going to get from it as well. It's very, very tasty. Uh, I'm going to take a break and have a drink. Does anybody have any questions right now? Yeah. Why do you assume that everybody does marijuana? <laughs> I was just in Colorado. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> um, I'm sure it's public knowledge, I guess, if you wanted to Google it right now. But um, you would think that if they did test for marijuana, they might be out of all employees. So since Colorado uh, has passed marijuana legally, um, they do not test anybody that lives in a state where marijuana is legal. And that is something that they literally had to bend over backwards, but w if they want, not, not that it comes with a territory, but if they wanted to get into this side of the business. Um, and again, it, I think it leads back to why Todd wanted to be president for five years, because he built a culture and you guys know craft beer is as much about the beer as it, as it is about the culture. Um, and if you take that away, then you're going to take away, take away the customers and the culture from it. So. They've bought, they've bought quite a few craft breweries, and they're not afraid to say if they made mistakes with them. Um, so what they've done, we're one of the biggest that they've purchased. Um, we definitely have one of the biggest uh, sales forces outside of Colorado. Um, are we? Yeah. Um, so they're kind of, uh, other than writing checks for us, which is very, very nice, um, they're a little bit hands-off, and they're, you guys, are doing, you guys are doing it the right way. You just let us know, you know what you need from us. We want to help you grow, um, which is definitely when you initially hear that, that you're, 
that Breckenridge is getting purchased, that's not really what most people thought was going to happen. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people said, if one thing goes wrong, I'm out the door. But it, it really has, hasn't been... Um, it hasn't been a negative experience. Um, there hasn't been any upper management that left. That I don't think anybody's even left the company, actually. Um, a couple people have moved into different roles um, with, uh, with the family of beers that they own, but um, it's not like, you know, other big breweries that have sold out and you kind of see people taken off. So um, for the most part, um, it's been pretty a pretty easy transition, and uh, I think it's going to it's going to benefit uh, you, the consumer, the most with, um, with all the new beers that uh, are going to be available. Speaking of new beers, this is a bourbon barrel age double IPA. So this beer before it goes into the barrels is 9.2%. This beer when it came out of the barrels was 11.2%. Uh, this beer is called 471 IPA. It's part of our small batch series. Do you have a question? Sorry, no. Yeah. No? I was trying to, I was sitting here thinking, I know I have a bottle, one of those, a big bottle in my basement. Now, from Breckenridge, I'll just leave it sitting here trying to get one of us. That's okay. Yeah. 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 That's what it is. Perfect. So this double IPA is a year-round beer. Uh, this is kind of the cult favorite of the brewery. This is what everybody sits around and drinks. 70 IBUs, incredibly well-balanced and not boozy or hot tasting at all. So very, very dangerous. You will walk into walls after having a couple of this one before it goes into the bourbon barrels. Uh, so being one of the favorite beers, they wanted to experiment it. So we're bourbon barrel aging it. Uh, it can be a little different on the variants every time we get barrels. We do use a broker. Um, I think the barrels that were around the warehouse at this time uh, were probably Stranahan's and maybe some Dickel barrels. Um, and what, are you brushing your teeth? What are you doing? Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, well, Stranahan's, if you guys don't know, is a Colorado distillery. Is anybody familiar with them? They're fabulous. If you get a chance to try them, uh, they make phenomenal bourbon. Um, but we are burble, bourbon. Hang on. <laughs> we are bourbon barrel aging this double IPA, and then every time we pull it out of the barrels, we dry hop it, and we're dry hopping it with a different hop variety. Uh, no rhyme or reason to why they're choosing the hop. I mean, it might be extra hops that we have left over, or it, it might just be something um, that's an experimental hop that they were able to get their hands on. Uh, the first one, we, weren't, we didn't have enough barrels, so we didn't package it, um, but the first one uh, was... Um, Sriracha Ace, fabulous, made it very, very sweet, added to the sweetness uh, from the bourbon barrels. Uh, we've done Whole Melon, uh, we've done Simcoe, Simcoe was actually an original hop that was in it, so trying to add a little bit more of the bitterness back into that beer that the barrel aging will take away. Um, and then this one is Eureka. Um, so some of the notes, it, they can be hard to pick up. Uh, but Eureka hops are a little bit citrus, a little bit peach and pine. I mainly get the peach from this one. Um, but, you know, try, try it several different times to make sure um, you're not missing anything on that, on that one. Um, and then the next one uh, that we uh, just started bottling is uh, dry hopped with citra. Um, so again, this is a very fun 22-ounce beer that you can purchase, sell them, uh, do a vertical over Christmas or something like that, something fun with. Um, but uh, again, it's just 471 was one of our favorite beers at the brewery that we like to experiment with. 471 was actually the address of our Colorado or of our Denver brewery before we moved. Uh, Simcoe was uh, prior to Eureka. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, not even a year ago. Maybe six months ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, Whole Melon was the first one that we bottled. 
And then the Sriracha Ace was the one that was in draft only. Huh. Does anybody have a favorite from the six beers that you've tried so far? Yes? Which one? Oh, you tried five beers? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Like the Christmas? That that actually came from another distributor. That yeah, they our, your distributor ran out. Uh huh. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, one more class. It's okay. I got a hotel. <laughs> Don't drink and drive. Um, again, just leading back to the new brewery in uh, Littleton, if you do get a chance to go out there, if you're looking to plan um, any uh, Colorado vacations, um, we have been able to do some pretty fun things in the Colorado market. Um, Avalanche Amber Ale being, um, Avalanche Amber Ale is the number one selling beer for Breckenridge in Colorado. Outside of Colorado, Vanilla Porter is the number one selling beer. Um, so Avalanche Amber Ale is, um, we've just been able to build a big new bar at, um, at the Pepsi Center for the Avalanche hockey team. Um, so that's very exciting. They finally, would they never have before, but they finally sell Avalanche beer at the Avalanche's home, which is nice. Um, also, we uh, partnered with the Denver Broncos. I'm not making any friends if I cheer for them. No? <laughs> I don't know if you guys were Rams fan and, and you needed a ho. <laughs> I was going to say, if you needed a home, we'll take you. Um, but we have uh, a beer, a uh, pale ale. Oh, Cronky? I'm not a fan of him either. Cranky. <laughs> Um, we have a new beer that is exclusively at Mile High and at our um, restaurant. It's called United and Orange. Uh, that it can stand for anybody who is a lover of the color orange. Um, we've had a lot of schools. Uh, Illinois, actually University of Illinois, was trying to get this beer. Um, UT was trying to get this beer. Um, but we've contracted only with the Broncos right now. Um, but it's an orange pale ale. It's quite delicious. Um, but you can, go, you can go to the brewery and get a growler of it. We have a really nice big growler station at the brewery, too. Um, so you are enjoying nitro chocolate orange. What do you guys think of this beer? This is good, isn't it? So people with nitros, I feel like they go one way or the other. They, they're like, I love nitros. Or they say, your beer is flat. <laughs> I said, well, essentially it is. Does anybody not know what a nitro beer is? It's totally fine if you don't. But... We are the team we thought we were. No, what was that? <laughs> so people uh, say, yeah, it tastes flat. I love nitrogen beers because they're silky, creamy, smooth, and they're less filling. You don't get as full. So you can tr probably drink double. <laughs> I mean, just doing the math. Uh Nitrogen beers, you know, as opposed to drinking uh, CO2 beers, um, you definitely get very, very full with those larger gas bubbles, like Chad was saying. Uh, are we nearing the end of the evening where we need to draw for some prizes? Pause the first beer, which was the Vanilla Porter. How many people like that the best? Uh, raise your hands. It's okay. It's okay. One? Um, yeah. I mean... Preferably not, but if you have to, you know, it's fine. Good. Two people. 
Two people. That's a little disappointing. That's okay. We're not, okay. We're not yeah. the vanilla porter brewery. Right on. We have five more. Right okay. have five more. Uh, the second one was uh, Christmas, Christmas right. Christmas ale. Hmm? Well, you guys have a lot of time to drink it. That's the best part. Mm-hmm. Lots of time. We have it on draft. I don't know. I, I know they have a, there's a lot right now, but who knows how long it's going to last. So drink it while you, while you can. Jerome, do you have a question or are you just raising your hand? Right on. All right. The fresh third hop? beer was Fresh Hop. How many people like Fresh Hop the best? Well, we have a lot of people that haven't raised their hand yet. I know. Hmm, what, what are they waiting means. for? I know. Boozy. They want the boozy beer. <laughs> Is that what you think what it's going to be? I think they might be going for the boozy one. You think? 11.2. How about the boozy one? Excited. How many people like the boozy one the best? Yep. Right, right. <laughs> It's okay. All right. How about the mango? Mango. All no right. mango for you. We have a really. You guys remember that? This Chris like Catan? No mango for you. All spread out and very strange. All right. How about the chocolate orange? A couple of takers on the All right. Orange. How many people didn't like anything that they drank in class today? Nobody? Well, that's good. Okay, good. Did, ever, did everybody vote? That was like the most spread out. Vote I've ever seen. I think they're intimidated from yesterday. Everybody's over voting. What happened? They said there would be no voting today. Well, I mean, it's 11%. I mean, the next closest one was like six. What's that? Oh, so how many more people would have voted for that if I didn't say the boozy one? But, oh, yeah. Oh, that changes everything. <laughs> okay. All right. You're, you got a point. You're right. You're right. You're right. I'm kind of drunk. I don't know. I'm t- drinking before class, too. All right. Anyway. Prizes, raffle time. Okay. It's a good beer. All right, and the last beer. Wow. Well, that's pretty wide well, spectrum you. there, huh? Well, I mean, you, you know, the last three are almost about the same. 